Good morning, everybody, depending on where you are. Um, and welcome to Race in the PR Classroom session for the HBCU Experience, um, presented by the Institute for Public Relations and the PRSA Educators Academy. Thank you for joining us to discuss this topic today. Um, I'm Dean Mundy. I'm the PR Area Director at the University of Oregon, um, and I'm this year's Chair for Educators Academy. Um, before we get into today's session, I wanted to let everyone know two opportunities that are resulting from this series. Um, this Race in the PR Classroom has become a monthly series. Um, we have a handful of topic ideas, but if there are things that you need addressing or if, that, that you feel you need addressing or if you'd like to serve as a panelist, please let us know. We're trying to map out um, the next few months. Um, second, thanks to a stellar idea from Natalie Tyndall, um, PRSA Educators Academy in association with the journal. Great ideas for teaching or gift session um, during our now virtual Super Saturday event in October, which will be held over um, a couple of Fridays in October, um, October 16th and October 23rd. Um, the winner or winners of the gift session will be published in a future issue of JPRE, and IPR will award $500 to the top winner. So stay tuned for more details on Booth. Um, I'd like to welcome today's host, Dr. Candace Parrish, Director and Assistant Professor at Sacred Heart Strategic Communication and Public Relations Master Program, Master's Program, Dr. Tia Tyree, Professor and Interim Associate Dean at Howard University, and Dr. Calvin Hall, Department Chair and Associate Professor at North Carolina Central University. Today's session is part four for peer educators and is focused on the HBCU experience. Um, before we begin, I'd like to remind you this is a Q&A type forum um, to ask a question. Um, you can either type it into the chat um, or raise your hand virtually. If you go down to the participants option at the very bottom, there is an option to raise your hand. So if you if you can raise it virtually. Um, once you're called on, please remember to state your name and organization. If you'd like to ask a, ask a question anonymously, please reach out to um, either the host independently or the moderators um, and type your question. Um, this is being recorded and will also be available for playback on the IPR website. And we'll also send you an email when the playback is available. Um, lastly, please remain respectful to our hosts and others on the call by keeping yourself muted at all times unless you intend to speak or ask a question. Candace first. Second. Is Candace there? <laughs> um, I could take a moment to say who I yes, am. Dr. Yes, Dr. Tyree, would you like to kick us off? Sorry about I, that. Absolutely. I'll, I'll keep it brief and then I'll let um, Calvin and everybody else have the floor. But I'm Dr. Tia Tyree. I'm a professor and interim associate dean at Howard University. Um, I practiced uh, public relations for more than a decade before I moved into academia. I like to say that I did literally everything. I did the music industry, politics, government, firm. Um, and so that little bit of time, I had the chance to really see how a lot of different industries move. But it gave me such a well-rounded experience Um, at Howard University, I teach our capstone course, which is Capcom Lab, which of course is the um, campaign course where we service clients from actually not just around Washington, D.C., but we've had um, federal government clients because, of course, our locality here, as well as some um, Fortune 500 companies and even little small nonprofits. So it really is a wonderful experience. And um, in addition to that, I see Candace popping in, so I'm going to fizzle down really quickly. Um, in addition to that, I also teach uh, the social media class, which gives me a lot of chances to um, really have conversations about what's happening in the real world. And I am going to turn it over to Candace. Hi, everyone. Sorry about that. Of course, like Wi-Fi would kick me out right as soon as I'm supposed to take it away. <laughs> so I'm so thankful. Um, thank you, Dr. Tyree, for filling in for me. Yep. <laughs> I'm so thankful for everyone who could join this uh, discussion today. Uh, those around um, me know that it's dear to my heart. And I also feel like we can't truly talk about diversity, uh, race, and inclusion in PR and PR education without talking about and engaging 
engaging with HBCUs. Um, so I've grown up knowing the importance of HBCUs uh, to our field and also to just the Black experience in the U.S. Um, as mostly everyone in my family went to an HBCU at some point, and I have an aunt that still teaches at one. Um, but for those who don't know the importance or who are not as familiar, HBCUs, standing for Historically Black Colleges and Universities, have existed as the most prominent institution for Black colleges and universities for over, um, or excuse me, for Black students in the U.S. for over 150 years. So as early as the 1830s, HB HBCUs were built and established to provide a means of education, intellectual grooming, and also community for Black people in the U.S. Today, HBCUs are still the most accommodating and accessible institution, educational institutions for Black people in America and also produce the most students into the workforce, and that also includes in um, communication. So it is because of in our discussions like the one today, many may not know that the very start of journalism and communication in um, at HBCUs was the result of discrimination and segregation. So in 1942, in the state of uh, Missouri, they ordered Lincoln University to start a J school, a journalism school, because student Lucille Bluford tried to uh, join the journalism school at the university to uh, welcome a person of color to study in their program or university. And so remnants of that essence from that experience are, they still linger today, which is why this is one, in, in 2020, this is one of the first discussions we're having about this probably in a long time. There may have been discussions before I came into the academic space, but since I've been here, this is the first of which that I have experienced. And uh, to me, that is uh, an area for, um, that is an opportunity for improvement for us in this academic space in PR. By leaving out HBCUs and the HBCU experience from our academic PR discussions, we have actually done a disservice to our field in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I'm hoping that today is the first of a few panel discussions that further delve into the advantages and challenges of HBCU inclusion in PR discussions and spaces. So without further delay, I would love to um, invite Dr. Tia Tyree, who was already talking a bit, uh, to share her uh, experience and then uh, followed by Dr. Calvin Hall to share his experience about, um, his, uh, about HBCUs and working there. And then we'll get into a couple of questions that help provide further context on what has been done and what can be done. I, I won't bore you again with, with my little bio. Um, I will tell you that I grew up for a little while um, in Baltimore, Maryland. I still live, live there, but I grew up at 1655 East Cold Spring Lane, and the address for Morgan State University is 1600 East Cold Spring Lane. And so I literally grew up in the shadows of Morgan State University. As a kid, I thought that when you go to college, you go to Morgan State University. Like That was just college to me. Um, and of course, that's where I went because it was just college. Um, and it really was an experience that, that changed my life in so many ways. And we could get into that a little bit later. But um, I wanted to talk and really just tell a story first. Um, and I won't give you much detail because I don't want anybody to cobble together the university I'm speaking of. But I came to talk uh, race at a university. And I was in this room probably about 150 or so. the campus and um, students were coming up and talking about race on campus. And a senior administrator came up and I'm paraphrasing, but what he said is, you know, we can talk about anything on the campus. That's what the circle square yard is for. In that, you know, race is important, but you know, get your permit 
and head on over to the square and have that conversation. And then, oh, by the way, if you want to um, have a microphone, make sure you get a permit for the microphone. And, and it was this very technical conversation about race, but relegated to this space. Um, and I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm baffled and I'm confused and I'm wondering what this all means and trying to respect the space as well. And when it was my turn, time to speak, I, I said, you know, at Howard University, my office is, is the circle. My, the hallway is the circle. My classroom is the circle. Street out front of my building is the circle. Um, there is no time or space where we, we need to, to cocoon the conversation about race, that, that race is, is who we are and what we are, and it defines the HBCU experience. And, and we can do that at any moment, whether it's one-on-one -on -one with a student in my classroom, whether it's me in front of 80 students, or whether I'm being teased out to have a conversation on the university level, um, I, I don't have to schedule my conversation about race. Um, and I think that's the beauty of the HBCU experience. Um, I have a book on it. And so um, I, I can tell you a little bit about the experience in general. But when someone comes to an HBCU, it's important to know that simultaneously, and I, I know this is difficult for some people to understand, but simultaneous is erase. Explain to you what that really means that you are in a space, and please don't assume that HBCUs are filled with African Americans, because that's absolutely false. Um, that you have Latinos, you have people from the Caribbean, you have people from Africa, you have people from Middle East. We are very much an international institution at Howard University. But it is erased in a sense that I am not not as a faculty member worried about my race at every moment. I'm not trying to navigate my race at every moment. Students aren't navigating their, their racial identity at every moment. That you can really be in a space where you are comfortable, which is not always the case for African Americans or other people of color at universities across the country, right? So to a certain extent, you have a level of comfort that you can feel like for a moment my race is erased but at the bcu so that your race is magnified right that i am engulfed in black culture that when we were talking about this the other day that when beyonce does coachella and she's doing her homecoming you're like why is that different i, I see that every year right um, or when you watch a different world on television, it's, it's not an experience for you. It's every day. Um, where my clothing and my hair and my skin color and the way I speak, none of that is, is unique. It's something that's celebrated. So HBCUs give you that opportunity to have your race erased and magnified at the same time. And knowing and understanding that I've had many students come into my classroom who are in the classroom with another person of color or an African-American person for the first time, right? They've been in, in classrooms where they were the only black student all of their life. So you have to understand the, the, the homogenous idea of who is at an HBCU is simply untrue. Um, with that said, I'll, I'll zero into to the question at hand, which is um, race in the PR classroom. And I will say to you clearly, that my obligation first as a public relations instructor is to teach the skills that I am, I am paid to teach, right? That I have objectives, that I have rubrics, that I have outcomes, I know I have assessments to deal with. That is first and foremost, that I am a professor of record who is here to teach a skill. That's the first thing. The second thing is, that as I am doing that, I am as obligated to do that as to understand the voice of my students, to understand that when they leave my classroom, that they have an obligation. Now, we should never have any one person feel like they have to speak for their entire community. That is not what I'm saying to you. But I'm saying to you that as a person in an HBCU, going through this HBCU experiences, hopefully understanding who you are 
getting a better understanding of your history, getting a better understanding of that which is you in current US culture, which of course is very problematic, that you understand how to navigate a few different things. First, you understand how to navigate the space that is the workplace, right? What does that mean for you to be black in that workspace, right? What does that mean to be black and working on a specific campaign? What does it mean to be black and see something in front of you that you feel uncomfortable with and having the tools and the knowledge to speak up, right? And part of that really is understanding that what you need to bring into the classroom to have those conversations. The type of culture you need to set in your classroom where you can have the tough conversations, where you can have a safe space. And that's something that my research has consistently uncovered that many times at PWIs, that safe space to have that racial conversation is either non-existent or difficult to create, right? Um, and I think that's where we have to be in our society where we're understanding that we have to have the tough conversations about race. It's very necessary to do so. And we can't just be having them at HBCUs either. Um, and so that's kind of, of, of what I do. I do that a lot through examples. I do that a lot through case studies. I do that a lot through um, home assignments. Having them really understand that you've got to know who you are. You have to understand where you are. And you have to understand what it takes to understand the skill and the culture of what it means to be Black in the United States. And more importantly, what it means to be a public relations professional in the United States. And again, a lot of that comes with creating a safe space, knowing that race has all, we are not in a post-racial society. We should have started the conversation out like that. Um, and because we are not, we must have racial conversations in the classroom. And we can talk about details later. That's it. All right, uh, Calvin, we'll turn it over to you. Okay, I gotta follow her? That was a lot. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Calvin Hall. Um, I'm gonna, I need to give you a little bit of my background. One of the things that, that's interesting that having been uh, at an HBCU and having, having seen, for example, uh, celebrations or organizations, one of the things that they always, that you always see in a program at HBCU, I don't, I, I don't recall seeing as much of it at, at a PWI, is that there's always a discussion of the history of whatever department. Um, I was at a graduation um, celebration for my cousin a few years ago at North Carolina A&T. And in the program, they had a discussion of the history of the department of whichever department he was graduating from. It wasn't very long, but it was a, there's always a discussion of history. And I think that's just very interesting and, and important because uh, it, it puts things into context. HBCUs didn't just spring out of nowhere. They, they, they were made to mean something, just like race was made to mean something. Uh, but, my, but my own experience, I um, was one of those kids that you were talking about, Dr. Tyree, who was always one of the one or two black students in a class at, at, uh, in, in the gifted classes or whatever they were. When you went to college, you were, you were you know, at a, at, an H, at a PWI that was 10% or single digit percent uh, black. You, you were that, you were going to be one of one or two blacks and you got together at the Black Student Union, you know, on, on your white campus. Um, but I'm also, I, my educational background, also, I'm a recovering high school teacher. Uh, had I still stayed in high school teaching, this would be my 30th year. Uh, I taught English and journalism at a school that uh, in our county in North Carolina, I'm from Asheville, North Carolina, uh, in our county was considered the black high school, even though we were only 40% 40 percent, uh, 40 percent black. Uh, it was the other it was 60, you know, 60 percent, but you have uh, 10 black people in a room of 100 white people is like, oh my gosh, there's so many. Uh, so it was that kind of situation. Uh, but I taught English and journalism. Uh, I enjoyed it. I was a student journalist at, at, uh, at my institution. And that, that experience is what sort of carried me into where I am right now. Uh, I'm, a, uh, I'm an administrator at, uh, at an HBCU. Uh, I came up really through the ranks as, uh, I started as an adjunct at the same institution that I, where I work now at North Carolina Central way back. Uh, in the 1990s, which seems so far ago, but uh, in, in some ways, but really isn't. Uh, before that, I was a, a student media coordinator at a small uh, private institution, St. Augustine's uh, HBCU in Raleigh, North Carolina. 
I was a newspaper advisor. Uh, I taught basically all the journalism courses. And teaching there at that particular institution, small, private, uh, you know, had some funding struggles, but it was what, it, what made me decide I wanted to stay in higher ed. And in higher ed, you have to, you know, get the union card if you want to have any kind of career. You got to get that doctorate uh, if you want to think about having any kind of long-term uh, career. And I, and I was fortunate enough to uh, uh, attend uh, UNC Chapel Hill, uh, where I got my doctorate, and really just started looking around um, at places and ended up at Appalachian State. Uh, for about 10 years of where I met Dean and Tina. Uh, they were my colleagues. And uh, it, was a, it was actually a really good experience for me. I was really, I was one of the, I was the only one. It was one of those situations where you, the situation where you're, you're that guy, you're the, the black professor uh, who was there um, and at, a, at an institution that was maybe 2% minority. And of that 2%, you know, 90% of those are on the football team. Uh, so that, that, so it's that kind of situation. Um, but it was a, it was a, it was a good uh, learning experience. Uh, there was a good, uh, strong community of, of, of black faculty and staff uh, who got together and discussed issues and um, tried to be a resource for students. Uh, and that was really helpful uh, for me. Um, but, you know, you know, after 10 years, uh, you, you start thinking about where you want to go. And, and the opportunity at, at North Carolina Central presented itself. And our, our department at North Carolina Central is about eight years old as a department. We're, we'd be going into basically our second grade year if we were, if we were a kid. Uh, they've had, they had a, an English and mass comm concentration, but as a standalone department, the Department of Mass Communication is eight years old. So you have some advantages in those ways in that you can, you can try new things. Uh, when I arrived in 2014, they had a proposal on the table for a, a uh, public relations concentration. And it was sort of my job, one of my first jobs was to sort of shepherd that through. Um, and it was, you know, our concentrations are basically six courses and, and the goal is to teach students the skills they need to be successful. Uh, the other issues, you know, uh, like Dr. Tyree said about race become not, not as magnified. It's like, what, what can I learn? How can I contribute? How can we teach our students to contribute what they can, what they can contribute by being themselves, working from the center from which they operate? I think, I think that's a, when we discuss things, even when we discuss creative activity, uh, you know, we, we forget, uh, when, I, when I hear these stories like in Hollywood about, about black creators not being uh, respected, respected it's, really, it's, it's really troubling to me because I've, I've experienced that. I'm one of my other, one of the other parts of my life is I do do creative writing. I've, I've, I've you know, pretended for a while to be a mystery writer. Uh, and so some of the critiques you got about characters that, and things you have to think about as a writer that white writers don't necessarily have to think about in terms, even things as minor as describing characters, like, well, why would I do that? Because my characters know, my characters are black because the center for which I operate creatively is, is black. And even bringing those sorts of lessons into courses that you teach, into decisions that are made about uh, people you hire, which is, which is one of my responsibilities uh, along with the faculty hiring people who can teach the skills, who, who come in with an understanding about uh, what it means for, uh, to work at an institution that is part of a cultural infrastructure. You know, black institutions are you know, part of a, of a cultural infrastructure. You can't just, you know, get rid of HBCUs. That's, that's, you can't just like getting rid of, of, of black businesses. You can't, they're, they're part, they've, they've developed into part of a cultural infrastructure. Um, but as, as an administrator, one of the things that, um, you know, I do is try to find people who can, who, who understand, um, you know, the mission of our institution, but understand that too, our, our students deserve the best of all that is, has been taught and researched and said in, in any endeavor in which we uh, wish to engage. And, and by creating a public relations concentration, you know, the university, the department, uh, before I arrived there said, you know, this is important. This is an area that it is important to have our graduates participate in. Uh, and so I try to remember that as I, you know, as we consider curriculum changes, as we consider uh, facilities changes, as we consider growing, um, growing that particular concentration. And also from an administrator, just from a strict number standpoint, PR is a, is, is a growth area in mass communication. Why would I not want our department to be part of that? And why would I not want our department to help create uh, graduates who contribute to that field in a meaningful way. 
uh, bringing whatever backgrounds they have, uh, socioeconomically, uh, uh, historically, or what have you. Uh, and so that's, that's, that's my story. And getting to the larger, uh, back to the other question, I'll, I'll come back to that after we let some other people speak. Thank you so Thank much, you. Dr. Hall and Dr. Tyree. <laughs> um, I think it is important to also mention that from my perspective, um, HBCUs are not only important to like the student population, but the entire educational ecosystem, including diverse faculty, minority faculty. I know from personal experience that um, when I was coming up on the job market, I had 14 informational interviews at AJMC that year. I had so many interviews, I couldn't even like experience the conference. Um, however, not one of them extended a job offer. I met Dr. Calvin Hall in the lobby of um, AJ, and that presented my first opportunity. So I think that's very important to note that a lot of people were interested, intrigued, they liked my research, they picked, they prodded, they, some of them even, you know, lifted my ideas and I watched things get created out of that, but no opportunities were there for me. So it's important to the entire ecosystem. Um, with that being said, I do want to go ahead and get into a couple of questions um, for Dr. Hall and Dr. Tyree. And the great thing about them both is that they are very seasoned in this game here. And so they have the uh, both the teaching level and the administrative level on these types of issues, actually advantages and challenges. So the first question that I want to spin off to you all is, what are advantages and challenges during um, the experience as a faculty member or administrator governing uh, faculty, I mean, uh, excuse me, PR curriculum? um at hbcus and that can include uh topics of mentorship and hiring um yeah so tell me what you guys think I'll start really quickly um I'll, I'll go quickly and then we can tag team a little bit i wanted to talk about mentoring and your experience actually um because i think it really does matter um who is in front of the classroom many times we try to pretend like the messenger um isn't important and that if you have someone who's experienced that's all you need in front of the classroom um, but that's not always the case especially at an HBCU um, there's plenty of research that tells you that gender and race pairings and mentorship are the most successful um, I'm not making that up that's out there already and so the idea that if you have a black woman in front of the classroom, the likelihood that that black woman who's a student might see her, reach out to her and experience like um, things in their life that allow them to bond and create a mentorship is real. Um, and so I want you to know that yes, um, HBCUs are a place for um, students to thrive, but it is also a place for um, minorities to thrive as um, instructors too. And I will say again, my mentor um, from Morgan State University was the one who convinced me that I could do um, academia. And he was the first one that gave me my first adjunct position at Morgan State University. So that idea again, and we talked about this, the um, each one reach one teach one is real in the black community. And I've seen it work for me as well. Um, I'll let you have the floor Calvin for a second. Uh, from teaching perspective, and we'll talk about the mentorship issue. For me, as a my first job as a as an assistant professor, PWI, you know, my my mentor was was a was a white male uh, who actually just retired this year. Um, but you know, one of the things I learned about mentoring and mentorship is that you have to have a, a lot of different mentors. Um, and fortunately, as I as I uh, as I had mentioned before. I had a number of, uh, there are a number of people on campus uh, at Appalachian who have been there, who are, who are, who are people of color, who are, uh, black people who have been there and been through the experience that I could, uh, when there was something in the department that wasn't you know, a need that I had uh, intellectually or what have you, uh, wasn't being satisfied in terms of uh, filling my, my uh, soul experience. Uh, I had other people I could talk to who had that institutional knowledge, who had been there, who knew, 
who knew who knew where the bodies were buried, as it were. Uh, so, so mentoring is, is a multifaceted thing, uh, especially when you're um, when you don't have the advantage of being um, in you know in, in community, as I, as I call it. Um, but but in, in terms of teaching, I thought it was really important for me in my classes to be. I guess if I, and I, that's all the approach I've always taken, but especially at PWI. To, to be be the person that expected as much from them or sometimes more from my students than their other professors, you know, which wasn't always going to be great. I always joke that you know, if you're a black professor on a white campus, your, your student evaluations are like a half point to a point lower uh, than, than they would be otherwise. Um, and, I, and I ran into issues of, you know, students would use their, the, the um, student evaluation time when we, we did had the method where you had Faculty, other faculty come in and, and and conduct your evaluations while you sat in the room, you know, sat in your office somewhere. You know, I had students who use it as sort of therapy and and talk about me to my my colleagues who you know I hung out with every day, and so it, it was very so it was very interesting uh, that particular dynamic. But over time, it became this uh, uh, to me a badge of honor uh, with regard to dealing with students at at a, at a PWI. Um, that yes, I was going to be the tough professor. Yes, I'm, if you don't if you don't do it, if you don't do my assignments correctly, yes, I will not be you know particularly happy. But I think that was that was a that's a kind of privilege that I think accrues to male professors in a way that may not necessarily accrue to female professors. I've noticed, especially black female professors, things that I could possibly get away with in terms of being demanding. I've talked with you know. Uh, female professors who taught at PWIs, it, it was looked at completely, similar things were looked at completely differently. They were looked at completely differently. And having that experience and going into, uh, going back to a, a, an HBCU and sharing those and hearing from people who like me had taught at a PWI and, and getting those, that comparison was, was really eye-opening for me. It was something I had assumed, but when hearing it from another person who had a similar teaching experience was really eye-opening. Um, I think the thing that I was struck by being an instructor, and, I, and I'm a journalism instructor. I, 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 uh, I, I love journalism. I believe in it, uh, uh, despite whatever other uh, issues it might have. Um, but, but PR, I, I've come to respect as a field, uh, both because of the possibilities and then for me as an administrator, it's a place where we can, we can grow our department. But one of the things that struck me about as an instructor there is that when students weren't being successful that I was teaching, it hurt me a lot more uh, to see students or, who weren't successful or who were, who were uh, hurting themselves with, their, uh, with, with, with certain student disciplines that uh, it, it hurt me more because these students were like, you know, look like me in a way that, you know, the PWI, I didn't, I didn't worry about because I know that like for at, at Appalachian, okay, you, you're a white student, and you want to not come to class and you don't want to, you know, do the assignments at your best level, well, they just don't go to, you know, Wake County and pull some more students to replace you. Uh, whereas with African-American students in particular, I, I felt, you know, that, that kinship was like, look, I know what's, what's out there when you don't take advantage of the opportunities that are given, when you're not being the best, uh, the best student that I, that I know you can be. It hurt, it hurt me a lot more uh, to, to sort of see that. And so um, I felt, you know, it, it, it comes incumbent on me to be, uh, to, ex you know, not expect more, but expect to try to, I don't say nurture, because I hate that, I hate that word. You nurture every, and if you're doing teaching, teaching is nurturing at every level. Uh, but you, you really, um, there's a, to me, there's a, a little bit more, uh, I wouldn't say connection, but there, there was that connection there, because I know what's out there for the students, and I know, um, you know what, what, what is what they need to be doing as, as, as uh, to be successful students and to be successful. Right. And it feels like a responsibility, right? Like yes. you as a black person, yes, <laughs> knowing that. what they need to achieve yeah. and what they are achieving. Yes. And I think like we had so many talks about that, and you know, the other day we spoke about it how I, I began to, um, and I was also a junior faculty member during my first appointment, and I began to give all my time 
to the students, teaching extra classes, you know, pro bono with research, starting up the PRSSA, you know, making sure I make new connections at local um, agencies so that they begin to get internships. But then that was also the stretch for me that I, I was not like excelling as a junior right. faculty I've member. had one of those, yeah. what, what I call the October talks with every faculty member that, who is, that I have, uh, who's come in new since you. Uh, mm -hmm. When you get to that October, the wall, I call it, and you come in because you come in into any, any teaching situation, but I think uh, for me coming into the particular teaching situation at, 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 at Central that I ran into, uh, where it was, you come in with, you know, these, I think, ideas about, you know, idealistic, you come in super idealistic, and then by October, you realize, okay, I got to, I got to modify things if I want, if I want the students to be successful, if I want to keep my own, uh, you know, uh, um, you know, mental health balance. Uh, but, you, but you, you adjust and you find out, okay, here's, here's what, here's what we can, here's how we can get to where I want to go. It's just going to be different here. Uh, and, and it wasn't necessarily, I think I ran it as a person, professor at a, a PWI regional, uh, what have you. Uh, there wasn't a level of, there was, PWI students were a lot more, a lot more vis secretly vicious than, uh, than at HBCUs. Uh, at HBCUs, the respect was always there. Uh, it, it, so, it was, so, so that made things a lot easier to take. Uh, but yes, yeah, I, 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 just comparing experiences, and, and it's interesting to me because both the institution where I am now and the institution where I was both have histories as teaching institutions. Uh, one was actually a teacher's college. Appalachian was actually a teacher's college. So they both come out of a teaching tradition. So it wasn't like I was coming from, you know, hyper flagship institution and, you know, turning my nose up at, oh, I'm going, I'm going to here. No, it was, there, here were two teaching institutions with very similar histories, even in terms of how they, uh, how they were received funding from the state. Uh, so it was a really good comparison seeing this, uh, the kinds of students you, you dealing with, uh, dealing with students. Can I jump in um, for a moment? Is that okay? I saw Molly come in the chat and actually I, I wanted to say it a little earlier because I know all of us here are thinking of what I can do. And I think that's kind of the theme coming through um, the chat room. And I just wanted to tell you at least four things that I do in the classroom to kind of have the conversations about race or make sure that my students understand, you know, what really is diversity because we talk, we're talking about race today, but we all know that when we talk about diversity and inclusion, it's much more than race. So the DNI wheel, of course, is a big thing to get to know. I know my friend Adrian Wallace is on. Um, and of course, there's other folks that dabble in that area, but it's important to know that, um, you know, getting them to understand that race is just one component of this diversity and inclusion conversation that we're having. But in terms of me in the classroom, of course, because I teach social media, I get to bring in tons of real life trending examples that my students know. And really being able to connect with them, you know, in the conversations that they're having that morning, knowing what's trending, and when those things can relate back to a company doing something or um, something that's race related, that gives you the easy way to ease in conversations about race when you look at something that's trending that morning and asking people, what do you think about this? Um, the second thing is, is that one of the big things that we have in my social media class, of course, is a big strategic communications plan at the end um, that culminates all of their learning. And I used to let them pick and then I've decided that wasn't the best method. So I usually give them about four challenges and every semester, every spring and every fall, I make sure that one of those examples is related to something that has to do with black culture. Um, so whether I pick, you know, uh, barbershop books um, or whether I pick, um, you know, Baltimore city pools, which I know are usually um, used by African-Americans um, or I pick something that I know is UNCF, for example, I'll pick something that I know is relevant to black culture that makes them think about what's happening with African Americans. Um, the biggest thing I also do for my capstone course is I actually seek clients who either serve or are black owned businesses. And because I do that, it forces them to be in that space 
thinking about what's happening with black customers or thinking what might be happening with um, a, a, a black woman owned business. And so I think that's another way if you're teaching one of those capstone courses, I did a cold call. It was something I had never done in my life to Berries by Keisha, which is a small um, strawberry dipped type of small business in Baltimore. And the owner was excited to get my call. She said, oh my God, I was thinking about what I can do to get some PR help because I can't afford it. And she was so thankful. So that gave my students a chance to work with a black business and gave a black business a chance to really get some free um, PR work. And the other thing I'll say is, please think about discussion boards. You and I both know that having those tough conversations in the classroom is difficult. Um, we all know that hiding behind this thing that is the camera, um, hiding behind keyboards is something that our students are used to, right? They're so expressive outside of face-to-face -face because that's what they, they live in. So if you want to have a conversation about race, it may be good to take it out of the classroom and into a discussion board where they might feel like, okay, I, I can say this. Um, you could even do anonymous. I think that's a little dangerous you've got to set those ground rules but even there might be some benefit in having some anonymous comments where people can really share what they think so those are for my four ideas for you absolutely thank you so much for sharing that um tia uh, dr tyree i also um wanted to just mention um we'll take some questions and stuff near to the end but I've, i think it's very important that we listen to the experience of uh, two administrators and professors at HBCUs. Uh, there's an entire series on race and PR, so make sure you stay tuned if you have further questions about that. But this one today, we're giving the stage to um, professors and administrators who have experience in teaching and developing communication curriculum um, at HBCUs. Um, so I would, so I don't know if there was anything else that you wanted to say, Dr. Hall or Dr. Tyree, along the lines of um, hiring or uh, mentorship or your experience as a professor. And if, if not, that's fine. We can get into the curriculum building, but. I mean, I, I, I will say from my perspective, I found Hiring to be, there, there are multiple challenges with, with hiring. Uh, one, just trying to get, get the positions to hire, you know, trying to find, get, the, get your institution to have positions that you can hire. Uh, ideally, I would like to, you know, because we are such a new department and the concentration that we have is so new, I would have liked to have had, you know, two uh, instructors when we, when we hired because we were trying to build that program. One person, as you found out, Candace, has a lot to do on his or her own and 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 the chair had so many things that he uh had that he wanted from that one person uh build the programs advise the advise the student uh, media experience um you know do your research serve on serve our serve our department serve on search committees that's uh those are those are things that you had to do on top of okay now look at this concentration curriculum and tell me what we would what we need to change and create the course that you would that you think students would benefit from and take skills out into the real world. I think that's the big challenge. That's the, one of the big challenges, institutional. It's just, okay, can I get enough people? And then once you get the person, can you make it attractive enough for them to stay? Which, you know, I thought I did, Candace, but, you know, um, so doing those two things. And then on the outside, finding the right, you know, not necessarily right, because I don't like that word that goes along with, with fit, and that's not a, a concept that I, that I like. But finding, making sure you have a, that you can pull from a good pool of people. Uh, if I had my druthers, I would, you know, sit, you know, do a census of every uh, research intensive institution that has a mass comm program, that has a PhD program and find out, you know, who they're, who, they're, who, the, who are the students they have that potentially could become uh, instructors at, you know, at any institution, but at an, at an HBCU. Uh, I lucked out. I'm going to be honest with you. I lucked out when I found you. One of my, this, this speaks to the value of connections. One of my uh, former cohort members in the PhD program I was in at, at UNC Chapel Hill uh, introduced me to you, actually thinking that I was at another school, which was a, thinking I was at a PWI, but, uh, but introduced me to you. And when I saw your, when I looked at your CV and I saw in it the 
I was like, whoa, this, this CV took some skills that I think our students need, needed. That's when I sort of said, hey, we're going to have this position open, apply for it. Um, and then, you know, that's having to deal with that struggle because you, you had some other options there uh, that you uh, were, were thinking about. So it's just a matter of finding people and then making sure that you, as your department knows, okay, what is your vision for this position? What is your vision for the thing that they're going to be teaching? And for me, it was just all about finding someone who could introduce our students to the concentration because the other thing that we found with our students, and I'm still finding this, you probably find this at PWIs as well, is that there's not a lot known about public relations. What, what, it, what is it? You hear it, but a lot of students don't really, they know they want to do it or they say they want to do it, uh, but they don't really know what it is. Uh, but then when you explain it, they seem to be really, oh, okay, yeah, that sounds like something good. But, but we still run into a lot of students who, at our institution are like that. And, and, and in terms of media in general, aren't, uh, don't have these, the student media experience and say coming from their high school where they might even know, you know, uh, the basics of journals because they worked on their student newspaper or they worked on their yearbook. Uh, we, our, our students don't come in with those advantages where, where they may as larger institutions or even the larger regional institutions. Um, and so, so we have to start at a different level in terms of just the educating them about that particular aspect of media. Yeah, I um, thank you for sharing that, uh, Dr. Hall. Along those like lines of like hiring, I know that directly relates to the curriculum and how you can build that out. Um, Dr. Tyree, do you have any thoughts on um, or experiences that you can um, graciously share with us today about the, maybe the advantages and challenges of hiring for to build out the PR curriculum? So I'll, I'll tell you that, and I know everyone here who's an administrator knows how difficult it is to get a line, right? How, how can you consistently explain your need? How can you consistently say it's not best to adjunct this class out? You know, we really need someone who can teach these things and understand our overall goal that we're trying to do within um, our department that we want to make sure there's come some consistency and understanding of of our um, curriculum that's not just kind of a one-off with someone who has a skill and can come in in the evening and do that. Um, and so I, I've been there trying to convince someone that, no, this shouldn't be a lecturer line. We need a tenured professor to come in and do this. So, so I get, you know, all of those constraints. But I will tell you something that was the most um, difficult but fulfilling exercise we did in our PR, um, actually it was our strategic communication sequence last year. And if no one's done this or you haven't done it in a while, I highly encourage you to do this because what we learned was eye-opening. And this is what we did. Um, we asked every single professor adjunct and full-time to write all of their outcomes for their class, all of the objectives for their classes, and all of the assignments that they give in those classes, as well as what were the topics of discussion that they have in those classes, right? So you've got three people that teach advanced PR writing. What are you doing in that classroom? You have two people that teach basic PR, one of which is an adjunct. What are you doing in that class? And really understanding once this huge matrix came together, what we thought we were seeing or teaching in that classroom what we what we saw were um, some I think uh, rights that should have been lefts, um, or or what were some holes that were happening that we realized you know when when someone comes to me in advanced public relations after coming from basic PR they must know these things and I see it happening in this course or with this section but not in that section so really taking a moment to say if we want to build a strong you know PR student we want to build a strong PR curriculum. We have to know what's happening in each and every one of, not just those classes, but those sections to create some consistency across the board so that we are building or creating what we need. Um, and I know there's all that academic freedom and I'm a big component of that. But at the end of the day, when we're trying to assess properly, when we're trying to create a certain curriculum that's strong, you have to do that, that real gut check and that that internal look to say, are we doing what we think we're doing? And if we're not, how do we figure it out? And what are our next steps? And that's something we did last year. And I truly believe um, that we were on the right track, but now we have actually the data to prove that we were and what we need to fix that. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. I think 
when um, I was at North Carolina Central University, that was one of the things that I started to try to do. Um, the challenge that I had was that there were more classes that I wanted to teach, but I was the only PR professor. And that kind of like kept me in those same like three classes. Um, but what I was able to do um, was work with some of our adjuncts and um, we had um, another professor come in and work with her um, teaching one or two classes to try to strengthen the cur curriculum across the board so that, I mean, because when you only have a couple of classes, that means what you're teaching is all the more, more important, right? And if there's going to be one or two options for classes, that makes cohesion all the more important, especially when you don't have a big um, staff or, you know, um, other PR professors to help you out. Yeah. Um, I know that we are, Dean, are we um, approaching time or tell me how it goes? We're approaching time. So, yep. Yeah, so um, we have about seven minutes left. And so um, we could open it up for questions. Um, there were a couple of questions in the chat or if, if, if anybody has questions or Candice, if you had other questions, we can, and then, and then um, Tina will close it up um, at the hour. Okay, um, I did see a question about like, what can like PWIs do to like reach across the bridge? And I think that's important. And one of the things that I hope comes from this discussion today, um, I would like to uh, charge um, you all to uh, let's have like a second part on this discussion, if not a third, but we also need to talk about uh, more about what we can do to like bridge the gaps and support each other as institutions because HBCUs producing the most college educated students into the field means that um, we can solve those issues that the commission said there were in 2018 when they released their report report. So um, do you do either one of you, Dr. Hall or Dr. Uh, Tyree have any thoughts on what um, PR professors at uh, PWIs could do to bridge the gap or do some course, you know, joint co course learning or opportunities? I, I don't know if Gemma is on this call from American, but I think we're a great example of trying to, to knock down the wall um, of not just universities that could be seen as competing, but just an HBCU and a PWI with great PR SSA chapters um, that have no reason to not work together. Someone asked in the chat, have, do we ever have an experience where HBCUs and PWIs have worked together? Yeah. Well, we hosted many years ago on um, the PRSSA conference in Washington, DC, and it was only because Gemma reached out and said, what do you think of working together? And we took that on and it was a great experience. If Gemma is hosting some type of um, PRSSA event, she'll say, hey, can your students come over? Hey, can you come over? And again, it's just that co collegiality that can happen um, just because someone decides to send an email, someone decides to, to make a telephone call. Um, and I think that's sort of what we need to do. Um, and especially now that we're getting so comfortable with the idea of, of Zooming someone in, um, if you can't afford to send someone, you know, a plane ticket or cover travel costs, then have something in and Zoom in an HBCU professor or just have one of us on a task force with you to bring in a different perspective. Um, but I really think that, you know, we could do more if you did what I did and just did a cold call, just send an email. Um, everyone's busy, but sometimes you would be surprised how gracious and, and accepting people are that you thought of them. Absolutely. And I know even from like my point of view right now as a director of a master's program, um, that's one of the things I keep in mind. I make sure that I'm recruiting from everywhere, but I also make sure that I definitely reach out to minority serving universities because um, those extensions, those offers, those, um, you know, your students can get, you know, their app fee waived. Those don't happen often. And that's exactly what we need to do to uh, work together and just progress the field of PR in general. Dr. Hall, did you have any last thoughts? No final thoughts, but I, I like uh, Dr. Tyree's suggestions. And I'm, I'm, I'm for uh, my part, I'm thinking of ways, sitting here thinking of ways uh, to partner with uh, institutions around us um, in a way that is 
you know, that is, that is beneficial for our students uh, and not just, uh, you know, helping other institutions deal with their, you know, <laughs> PWI diversity issues. Right. Um, but I, I think the biggest challenge for me is just figuring out, you know, getting someone in to make sure that our, our curriculum stays dynamic, that it meets the needs for our students, that it meets the needs for uh, where the industry is and where it's going. Uh, I think that's the, the, the biggest thing that uh, HBCUs can, uh, can offer you know, the, in, the PR industry is, is, is to give it some direction in, in areas of diversity that enrich the whole profession. And that's really the, the challenge that, that we have um, uh, as a department. And they're trying to convince the university that we need, you know, I need, an, I need more professors. Thank you. Um, I can, uh, well, first, before we, uh, we close out, Dr. Tyree uh, was very generous to offer a giveaway of her book. Dr. Tyree, do you want to facilitate the giveaway or, or how do you want to do this? Uh, we'll make it easy. Um, the first person in the chat who can name the first HBCU will get a free copy of my um, book called The HBCU Experience. So it's a great read. I think there's 60 or so really um, quick personal stories of um, people who graduated from HBCUs. It's a PG-13 read. There's only two kind of um, higher level uh, essays. There they are. So David Brown has it. <laughs> um, I'll send it to you Yay. so somebody can get his information. Um, but again, it's a wonderful read. If you ever wondered like what it's like, um, the stories range from the 1960s to um, the 2000s. So it's a good kind of very personal stories about the experience. Great, and I have David's address already, so I can. Yeah, David, winner at our first, uh, our first uh, race for second series. Uh, so I wanted to thank very, very much, uh, Dr. Tyree, Dr. Parrish, and Dr. Hall uh, for being here today. Uh, this has been so. This is always so insightful, and we appreciate you all taking the time. I know how extremely busy you are, um, and I was really excited. Everybody showed up also uh, in July. So that just shows how, how important this is. And I also wanted to shout out, I see about six of my IPR trustees who are chief communications officers in the field. So it's really great to see all them on here as well. Uh, and, and I think probably the advice too is if they want to work with some of the students and recruit them is contact you all as well uh, to, uh, to place students when they graduate. So um, thank you all. Our uh, next session is on August 20th. This will be recorded and put on the website by the amazing Nikki Caceres and our team who will put that online. Uh, so thank you all so very much for being here and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>